Greetings, everybody, again. Some time ago, I got an email from someone who seemed really depressed. That's a good way to start, isn't it? <laughs> She's in God's church. She knows the general prophecies and promises ahead of us, but wonders why God would call her. She knows God's not at this time trying to convert the world, but is starting with a much smaller harvest, a group called the First Fruits. She knows that, and you know that. She knows the main harvest comes later. She understands that the first fruits are being called now to be trained to be priests, rulers, teachers for others who will follow in the coming millennium. We know God is building a temple, a kingdom, a house of God. We know he'll have a lot for us to do and that we won't be sitting around for eternity in some beatific vision forever and ever and ever. We understand that, don't we? That we won't be sitting on clouds for eternity strumming our harps. And maybe some of you don't even like harp music. Well, don't worry, because that's not our future. That's not what's coming ahead of us. She knows all that, and so do you. If you've been a regular listener or a member of God's church for any time. But her questions went along something like this. I know why God is calling a few now in a general way, but why me specifically? Why do I? What do I bring to the picture? I have nothing much I could offer, so why would God choose me, she asked. Maybe there's been a mistake. Maybe there are millions of better, brighter, nicer, more righteous, more gifted people. Maybe I haven't even, I haven't even been called at all. Why would God want someone like me? Those were the questions she asked. Have you ever wondered those same questions? Why God would call you? Have you ever had the same question she had? I don't mean the general question of why God's calling a few people today, but why God called you and you specifically. I've had those questions. I don't think her questions were unusual. I think many of us in God's church sometimes suffer a sense of failure, a sense of worthlessness, or a lack of purpose. Have we lost, in fact, the sense of belonging, of being part of something grand, a heroic cause? Some of you are very old. Some of you are very young. Some of you feel too poor, too crippled, unable to do much now for anybody. Some of you are in faraway lands and parts of the country, too far away to be part of the action. Some of you are in Africa or Eastern Europe or Asia, and so the questions persist. Others can wonder why God waited so long to call them. Why didn't he call you when you were younger, stronger, healthier? Yet others were born in the church with believing parents, and we watch sometimes as we wonder if some of them always appreciate the, that calling. I'm, I was kind of born in the church. My mother, my grandparents before me uh, were in God's church and called to the truth. But we can wonder where these people who leave the church, who were born in the church, were they truly called? So I took the challenge of answering, of trying to answer at least, the question of why did God call you specifically and why now? And I hope you'll find this two-part message thought-provoking and inspiring. And if this message does help you, help, help spread the word. Get the message out about the website. And one more thing, I do recommend you get a transcript. As always, I think you'll find that that helps you to uh, get a deeper, uh, more complete sense of the picture if, uh, if you'll do that. So back to the question, why did God call you and why did he call you now? Right off the bat, let me caution you here. We are not God. I'm not God, certainly. I will not fully be able to know all the reasons or even the main reasons why God called you and me specifically. But I'm hoping that by the time we're done with this two-part sermon series, that we'll be able to have a few more possibilities, maybe even some probabilities, as to why God chose you that you may not have thought of before. I hope you'll find them thought-provoking and inspiring. Having said that, we can't even begin to comprehend the total picture that we'll be part of. For God, I believe with all my being, is planning something way beyond our wildest dreams. Ephesians 3.20 talks about how he's able to fulfill far greater than we had hoped for or asked for. And that we only see in glimpses now, it says in other places. We only see darkly now. But we can trust that God is preparing for us something that will bring him glory and will also share in his glory. And in my transcript, I'm not turning to all these scriptures, I have tons of scriptures, but in my transcript I write down all the scriptures that re refer to these statements. 
in Hebrews 2 verse 10 it does talk for example in my transcript about bringing many sons to glory now many seem to feel that God is just looking for a certain magical number a certain number of people and he picks and chooses many people and then throws them all kind of against a wall and sees how many stick is that it is that your concept and those who have the ability, the energy, the willpower, and the character to stick to the wall, to endure to the end, to hang on to the end, somehow on their strength they qualify and make it, those are the ones who will be in the final magical elect number. I don't go there personally. That might surprise some of you. It can sure seem that way sometimes. But if that's the way it is, and it's supposed to happen that way, who would get the glory? You or God? I want you to think about that. If you were able to make it into God's kingdom yourself, who would get the glory? And I'd like you on your own, slowly sometime, to read Romans 4, verses 11 to 18. That's not my topic today, and so I'm not going to spend time on that. But is that the way God's doing it? Just calling a certain predestined number of people... And uh, But he has to call way more than that, kind of like overbooking a flight, because some won't show up, and so you might have enough finally to fill the seats. Is that the way God's planning his kingdom? Really? That's the way I've heard it explained by some. Now let's start by reviewing clearly who it is who makes the selection. And we'll, This first sermon is going to set the foundation. The second sermon is going to go into far more detail as to the ex exact reasons why God is calling you right now. But I think you'll find this first sermon very interesting. I hope you will anyway. Spend an awful lot of time on it. Who does the calling and then the choosing? What I'm about to say will be fully backed up with scripture references in the transcript of this message you can download from the website. Uh, so I won't be turning to a lot of them. Who draws you to himself? God the Father or Jesus? Now if you've heard my sermon on God the Ultimate Father in my series titled The Mystery of Christ and the Church, You'll understand that I teach that what Jesus himself said, that when Jesus said in John 14, he said, My Father, God the Father, is greater than I. John 14:28. Jesus referred to God the Father even after his resurrection, after he was a spirit-born son of God. He said in John 20:17, I send to my Father, to my God and your God, to my Father and your Father. So he referred to God as his God. God the Father is called God in the highest. And, and, and we're told in 1 Corinthians that the head of Jesus is God. Just as the head of the wife is the man or the husband, the head of uh, the husband is Jesus and the head of Jesus is is God. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. I'm not turning to these. 1 Corinthians 11, 3. So they're not equal in rank, authority, power, or glory, even though the traditional Trinity teaching says so. That's not correct. The Father is clearly the highest. We've taught that for years and years. Father put all authority and power into Jesus after his resurrection. We find that at the end of Matthew 28, uh, at the very end, the uh, last few verses of the book of Matthew, where he says, though, where Jesus says, the Father has given me all authority and power. And then we find in the end of 1 Corinthians 15, how, or at least in the middle of 1 Corinthians 15, it's in verses 27 and 28, that there's coming a time when uh, Jesus himself will, will hand back everything to God the Father. And that God the Father put everything, everything under Jesus, except himself, it says. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15. And so it's very clear in the Bible that Jesus is second to God the Father. And we are to honor, believe in, and glorify Jesus as we do the Father. He said that in John 5. On your own read sometime, John 5, verses 20 to 30. Now, having said all those scriptures, we'll start looking up a few. But please be turning to John 6. I'm just saying that the highest being in the universe is God the Father. Generally speaking, God the Father is having the Word, Jesus Christ, do the creating, speak His plans, the work to work with people who are called. Jesus is the more visible part of the God uh, family, if you will, if that's the right term. Um, 
the more visible part of what God is. Jesus was the visible God who was seen and heard in the Old Testament by Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Samson's parents, and even the Israelites heard the voice from Mount Sinai. And no one, we're told a couple places, have ever seen God at any time. And that has to mean God the Father, because they certainly did see God in the Old Testament, but it wasn't God the Father, it wasn't God the Highest. And certainly the disciples and hundreds of people, thousands of people, saw Jesus, who was God on earth. We read that in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, was with God. And then in verse, I think it's 14, it says, the Word became flesh. And so the Word, who was God, became flesh. And so certainly a lot of people saw Jesus even after his resurrection, when he certainly was once again God. So Jesus has been God's mouthpiece, God's messenger, God's servant, and God's son. And he is now also, of course, and always has been, God, as well as God the Father. But they are one God, and we'll, co we'll cover all that some other time, how that can be so. But there's one big, big, huge area that God the Father has not delegated or relegated to Jesus Christ or to anyone. What is that area? It's the one area the Father holds dear and close to himself. He personally does this job and no one else, not even Jesus, is allowed to tackle this particular task. John 6, verse 44 John 6:44 No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day unless the Father who sent me there again you see the the greater uh, authority the Father has the one sending has greater authority than the one, than the one sent but the Father who sent me draws him excuse me a second here <coughs> I have uh remnants of a cold here I'm trying to battle so I hope, I hope the recording comes out okay and I will raise him up at the last day you know the word draws him in John 6 44 has the connotation of drags him check the Greek it's incredible God is so merciful to us sometimes we're not even all that eager to be invited or chosen by God remember Lot it said they had to urge him and drag him almost out of the city of Sodom Moses wasn't so eager to be invited to help out in the beginning either remember that Moses was kind of uh, dragging his feet. Now, verse 65, John 6:65 6, repeats the concept. He said, Therefore I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. And then in John 6:45, he says, Jesus says those who learn of the Father next come to Jesus, who takes over the task of, of preparing us for the kingdom of God, and he does it perfectly well. The point is this. Yes, the supreme God... The Father of Jesus, the God being whom Jesus said was his God, it was this supreme God, the God of the universe, the Father of all fathers, handpicked you, perhaps even dragged you, maybe kicking and screaming, I don't know, out of this world society. Some of you will willingly remember and admit that you didn't want to be called at first. You fought it at first, perhaps. But if you've ever felt lost in the crowd, unnoticed. I want you to wake up to the fact that you, if you're hearing this message, were very likely personally planned and selected by none other than God the Highest Himself, the most incomprehensible, powerful, awesome personality in the entire universe. God, the God and Father of Jesus Christ, hand picked you. What's your name? Put it in there. Now, how special is the fact that God the Father himself called you? I need you to let this sink in. He picked you to become a part of what's called the body of Christ, to be the very wife of his son, to be the teachers, the priests, and the rulers of his kingdom, the kingdom of God. Not very many will ever be allowed to be the bride of Christ, or once that bride is married, there won't be a second bride and, and, and the first resurrection is called the better resurrection. You're being called to be part of that spot. Now, don't confuse being called with being chosen. Matthew 22:14 says, Many are called and few are chosen. Calling has to do with being invited. I have a little more in my transcript here, but 
uh, the Greek word for chosen has more to do with being the elect, the chosen, the part of the elect, the ones who respond to that calling, and God chooses them and works with them and has them be there. And we can read at the end of Revelation 17:14 that those who are with Christ when he returns, and notice the sequence, are the called, chosen, and faithful. So we have to be invited or called, and you have been. And then we have to respond and be chosen as the elect. And if you're baptized and you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, and I hope you do that if you haven't, don't let another day go by that you don't repent, come to Jesus Christ, and get baptized by a faithful servant of God. Then you're part of the elect as he gives you his spirit and become a child of God and, and obey him. And then we have to endure to the end, remaining faithful to God to the very end. We'll talk about all that in a later in a, uh, depth in a later time. I think you'll be amazed, though, how God the Father is involved in all aspects of it, though Jesus has a huge role once we're called. But God says he does the choosing. I mean, he not only calls us, he also chose us. He says in John 15, uh, John 15, verse 16, he says, I chose you, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and you cho you didn't choose me. And then after he calls us, he does turn us over to Christ to work with and to perfect. All the scriptures are there in my notes. I hope you download them. Now turn to Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7, please. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. God sees the end from the beginning, and for his glory chose you. And as far as he's concerned... If we endure to the end, he sees us as already sitting with him on his throne, with Christ on his throne. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7 in the, in the New Testament. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, dead spiritually, in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So, point number one is he called us uh, early on here. I mean, that's not even point number one. I'm just making the point that God the Father called us and he called us in a way that shows his grace and his mercy to us. But now we go back to 1 Corinthians 1 and uh, the familiar 1 Corinthians 1, 26. And we'll read right to the end of verse 31. And this time I'm reading out the New International Version. Since you've heard it many times in the King James and the New King James, I want to hear it just from a little slightly different translation here. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. I do prefer the King James and New King James as my study Bible. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. There's point number one. Why did God pick me and pick you? Because we're the nobodies of the world, and by doing so, he can shame those who think that they know it all and are the wise and the strong of society. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world. That's me, brethren. That's you. And the despised things. He doesn't even say ones here. He says things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. We don't even exist as far as the world's concerned. So no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it's written, let him who boasts, or the New King James says glories, boast in the Lord, or glory in the Lord. So right here, one real good reason God called you and me specifically is to show what he can do with very ordinary people. He is not doing his work primarily with gifted news anchors. He's not subsidizing his gospel through donations from billionaires and millionaires. God's not even running his church through talented money managers, people handlers, private bankers, or anything of the sort. We know that, don't we? He's doing his work 
with very ordinary people to shame and confound the wise and the strong of the world. So we can't boast of making it on our own merits. Read again verse 30 and 31, which make it clear. It is through what God is doing in us through Christ, who has become our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. And if we're doing anything helpful to God, it's because of Christ in us, not because of our own righteousness and goodness. Think about what God accomplished from just 12 disciples who were very ordinary men. Three or four of them were ordinary fishermen. One was a despised tax collector. One might be what we might call an insurgent, or in the least a hotly fanatical stickler to mosaic ritual, Simon the Zealot. We know almost nothing about the background of most of the disciples, probably because there isn't much to know about them. Most of them came from the back hills country of Galilee, an area not very widely respected. They were unskilled, unlearned men from the world's point of view. And yet they turned the world on its ear. They were not educated in any well-known school, seminary, or university. And yet after the resurrection in Acts 4.13, the world took note that they had been with Jesus. Well, you and I can also be with Jesus if we let him speak with us via his word. As I point out in my sermon titled, Manna, have you had your manna yet today? And make sure you hear that one if you haven't heard it yet. Jesus had transformed these men. And Jesus can and Jesus must transform you and me too. Brethren, we all fail a lot. I do. And you do. People can call you and me hypocrites for not perfectly following what we teach and believe. But a lot of that is because we are weak of the world. The off-scouring of society, the Bible actually says that. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 13, we're called the off-scouring, the ring around the tub, you know, of society. I must say this about me, and you probably nod the same thing about you. I'm not yet what I'm supposed to be. I'm not yet what I'm going to be. But thanks be to God, I am no longer what I was. And in fact, we can say, there are verses that talk about we have become the righteousness of God that he gives us and clothes us. I, th I think that says it pretty well. God has a ways to go yet in perfecting us. But that perfection was realized in Jesus who's going to clothe us with his righteousness. But just ordinary people, you and me, called to do extraordinary things, to change what we are, to become converted to God's way, and God gets all the glory and all the credit, of course, because he's the one doing it. And that's what 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 30 says. He's the one affecting the change. The change has to be a sea change, a total, complete change. Hear my sermon on new creation for more, more on that. One lady called me many years ago and basically said, I'd like to attend your church. And I just was curious. I said, what prompted the call? Why are you saying this? She said, because whatever you've done for my two sisters, you've got to do for me. I asked what she meant by that. She went on to say how they had made a total turnaround in their conduct, in their language, in their behavior, their attitude, their demeanor, everything. Now I want you to do the same for me. I, I said it nicely. She said they were once, and she used a word I can't use on tape here. And now they're so nice. <laughs> anyway, I laughed and I said I'd done nothing for him. But I could introduce her to the cleansing work of her Savior. And that he is the one with the spiritual spot remover. He is the one with the spiritual iron who removes the wrinkles and faults and blemishes we have. Praise be to God. What a testimony. Those two women who came in the church. What a testimony and a witness they were for, for their sister. And for God and what he was doing. These are the people God's calling. People like Elijah, a man with a nature just like ours, we're told in James. Poor widows like the one who gave her last two cents or mites. You know, in Acts 22, we're told that mobs called for Paul's death, for he is unfit to live. It says in Acts 22:22, 22, 22, Many of the prophets were shepherds, 
sycamore tree tenders, ordinary people. David was a mere shepherd. And so you're in good company, really good company. God wants those who do have the talent and the background, the natural abilities, the wealth, the contacts to be shamed by what he can do with people like you and me when we get ourselves out of the way and let his spirit work in us. So that's point number one, to shame the wise, to bring him glory and bring glory and demonstrate his power. It does say, though, not many mighty and noble, noble were called. Do you know, there were some. I want to take just five minutes or so and tell you about a few, maybe six minutes, so you realize there are some of those royal and mighty who have been called. Boy, I hope you can understand me, okay? My, my voice is uh, very much reflecting a cold right now, I think. So why did God call the mighty and the royalty and so forth? They're, they're, he did call a few, a very few. You know, God wants a sampling of all kinds of humans, of all types, who can relate to others in the kingdom. We don't have many attending with us right now, that's for sure, who are governors and senators, millionaires and celebrities, none of us in the world's who's who. A book about you and me might even be titled, The What's That? Instead of The Who's Who. <laughs> I thought you might be surprised at who, in fact, were of the royal uh, royalty and nobility of the mighty of the world. That God did work with, God did call. Here are some of them. And I'm sure I missed a bunch. Or at least a few. Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarai. Some feel that Abraham and Sarai were prince and princess. Josephus, in his uh, book one, Antiquities of the Jews, uh, chapter seven, says about Abram that he actually reigned in Damascus for a while. Josephus just says it as a matter of fact. He reigned in Damascus. This would certainly explain how he could not have gone into any area like Egypt without everybody noticing. But first of all, he had a royal size entourage, especially for that day or even by today's standards. Remember he had 318 trained men for war, just for war, not even counting perhaps hundreds more regular servants, shepherds, workers, their children and families. So when Abraham moved, thousands of people, at least hundreds and hundreds, but probably several thousand people would be part of that entourage. Remember, he was also very wealthy in terms of livestock. So whenever those several thousand people would move, there were, all, there were also large herds and flocks moving with them. And there's ample evidence that Abraham could well have been, in fact, the teacher of the sciences, astronomy, and higher mathematics to the Egyptians. That's my belief. Might fascinate, might fascinate you to realize that God had to call Abraham twice before he actually went all the way into Canaan. I've heard many sermons about how God says to Abraham, get you out of the land of your fathers, go to Canaan, and he got up and he left. That's not really what happened. The first time, he stopped at Haran and waited for his dad to die. You can read that in Acts 7. Check it out sometime. It's really amazing. Acts 7, verses 1 to 4. And then God had to nudge him a second time and said, basically, this time, go all the way, Abram. Abram, go all the way. And I want you, in fact, to leave your family. Your family's getting in the way here. Go back and study that. The end of chapter 11 of Genesis, you'll see how they, they were on their way to Canaan, but stopped at Haran and died there. And then, chapter 12, verse 1, is when God tells him to go all the way. Now, this is how the man who became the father of the faithful started. I don't know if you've seen that before, thought of that before. Joseph, though he was apparently called as a simple teenager, not yet great or anything like that, he became very great. He became the number two man in Egypt at its zenith. Certainly he was a prime minister at the very least. Pharaoh called him Zaphanath Panea, which means savior of the world, after he had that plan to save up the food and all that, you know. That was a worldwide famine. And then he had to marry Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. That's in Genesis 41, verse 45. Genesis 41, 45. Josephus, the Jewish historian, again says this priest of On, Potiphera, was none other than Potiphar. Certainly very similar names. Who had made up to Joseph by then and gave Joseph his daughter in marriage. 
This promotion took place when Joseph was 30 years of age. Now, later Moses, so Joseph was certainly of noble nobility called. Moses was raised as the son of Pharaoh in the courts of Egypt. From the time he was a baby, uh, I think Josephus says he was unusually beautiful, and maybe even large, I think it says. And so they knew, and he also says that his parents had been told in a dream that Moses would be the deliverer. So Moses seemed to think so too. When you read the account in Acts 7, verses 23 to 25, I'm not turning to all of these. I think you know the stories. If you don't, go back and read them on your own. But in Acts 7, verses 23 to 25, it says that when he killed the Egyptian, he figured that the Israelites would just kind of know that they were supposed to follow him. I guess the word had kind of gotten out among them that he might be the deliverer. Anyway, he was raised as the son of Pharaoh and um, probably had some pretty high potential there. Esther, meaning star, the Jewish orphan. Again, Josephus, the Jewish historian, says she was of herself of the royal family also. And that's in Antiquities of the Jews, book 11 that I have, chapter 6. Esther became a queen in the Persian Empire, wife of Ahasuerus, who many feel was Xerxes, but Josephus and others say it was the son of Xerxes. Whichever, she was a queen of a mighty empire. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, and God used her <coughs> to become the wife of the greatest man on earth in their day, the queen of a mighty empire. What a powerful statement that God can do with a young woman like this. And then Ruth, the poor Moabite women, she also may have been of royalty. Uh, the rabbis say she was a daughter of, guess what, uh, guess who, the King Eglon of Moab. I found that very hard to verify, but that's what they say. Daniel, Daniel's three friends were clearly told this time in the Bible that they were of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. So that's in Daniel 1.3. Daniel was of nobility or royalty, in other words, as was Zerubbabel, as was Mary, as was Joseph. And so, so far we have Abraham and Sarah, Joseph, Moses, Esther, Ruth, Daniel, Daniel's three friends, Zerubbabel. You see, Zerubbabel means seed of Babylon. He was of the line of David, though. And then in Acts 17.34, turn over to that one. That one's kind of interesting. I'll wait for you to turn there. <clears throat> I have to cough once in a while. I hope you put up with me, and I, I'm sorry my voice isn't clearer. But Acts 17, verse 34, it talks about the Dionysius, the Areopagite, who was an early believer. Now, the Areopagus is a place I've been, and right there in Athens. The Areopagus was the equivalent to our Supreme Court. So an Areopagite was a Supreme Court Justice. Carol and I have, have in fact been to the Areopagus in Athens, a hill where there's, those decisions were made, and we've dined in the little diner next to where Mars Hill was, and where Paul gave his famous sermon about the unknown God in the, in the marketplace. So, um, very interesting little place. But um, it, the point I'm making, though, is that one of the early church members was a Supreme Court uh, member. It would be like having Sandra Day O'Connor, who just resigned, as being part of the uh, Church of God. Wouldn't that be something? And then turn over to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. <clears throat> and in verse 22. Philippians 4, verse 22. Philippians 4, 22. All the saints greet you. But especially those, Philippians, Philippians 4.22, especially those who are of Caesar's household. Caesar's household. Now turn to Philippians 1, verse 13. And he talked about how even the things that were happening to him have advanced the gospel. And that he, uh, what was happening to him was known even among the palace guard. The palace guard. Now, did you get that? Some of the early church members were from the very family, very household, certainly from the palace, if nothing else, of the emperor. They probably didn't want that voiced around too much, but that's in scripture for you and me to know. At the very least, these had to be people who worked in the palace, 
but the Greek clearly says of the household. I know some of the more modern translations can't believe that, so they changed it to household, I mean household to palace, but whatever, it was pretty high, uh, highly placed people. But for the most part, there weren't many nobles and royalty called by God, and you aren't among the nobles, so what? Who are they compared to the new calling we'll all have and have been called to by God? Certainly God wanted some royalty, some mighty of the world to be called, so there would be some in his kingdom who could relate to royalty and the mighty more than you and I could. Now you teens and children hearing this may not think of your dad and mom and yourselves as royalty, as being a prince or a princess, but you are. In fact, you're being called to become a king or a queen. You may or you may not have royal blood right now in your family tree, but that doesn't matter. That's all rubbish, Paul said, dung, he called it in the King James, compared to the calling he had now. So, you're not the son of a daughter of a human king or queen, or even a tribal ruler in Africa. So, you're not descended from Richard the Lionhearted, or Shaka Zulu, or the Ming dynasties, or even the shoguns, but are being groomed to be the son or daughter of God the Father, the supreme God. God in the highest planned you, picked you, and formed you, and called you. You're being called to be the son of God in the highest of the entire universe. You can't get any more royal blood than that. That's why Peter said we're a royal priesthood. And we better start acting and living a life that reflects it. Start Stop the fooling around that we're doing. We need to stop the infighting among God's people and start to live the life that reflects God fully in our lives. Turn our hearts to Him. Turn our children's hearts to Him. But talk about royal blood. Do you see it? Do you think of that high calling? Does it keep you awake at night from all the excitement that you've been called by God Himself? I mean, if you had an invitation to have dinner with the Queen, from the Queen herself, if you had an invitation from a baseball player or a celebrity or the president, how would you feel? God himself chose you. Brethren, you've struck the mother load. Except you didn't strike it. God, God brought you to it. It doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't matter if you're hearing, hearing this in a village in Kenya or in a city in the United States or off the Internet. You could be among the precious few God is personally working with in New York or a teenager in California or perhaps in some out village in Uganda. It doesn't matter. Value, cherish, and guard and love and praise God for your high calling. What's in your future? Why don't we talk about it more? We're called to be co-heirs with Jesus Christ over all things ever created. Co-heirs of the whole universe. And when God the Father grants this to Jesus as kings of kings, you and I are being called to be his wife. A wife shares in everything a loving husband has. She inherits all things with her husband. And we are going to inherit all things with Christ. We are called to be co-heirs with Christ. Romans 8, verses 14 to 18, if you want to read it. Romans 8, verses 14 to 18. You have a very, very high calling, and God doesn't take lightly when we treat that calling with any disrespect. Brethren, we've got to be waking up to it. We're being called to be the building, to be building on the very foundation of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the kingdom of God. We're being called to be born again, for without being born again, none of us will see the kingdom of God. Now, later in this sermon... Perhaps in the second message, we'll address the, to what have we been called? For what purpose? It's not just for selfish ambition or bragging rights. It's not that. You've been called for some very specific reasons, which we'll get into much more detail in the second sermon. But for now, let's move on to building on the foundation of these concepts. So we now know that God the Father personally handpicked you and that he's picked a few royal and noble, but not very many, 
but he's brought all of us now into the highest of nobility and royalty by bringing us into his very family. Now, the next question I want to ask you, and I, I think you'll find this intriguing, when, when did God begin to call you and choose you? If you're in a group, I'd like you to just listen for a minute or two, then turn the tape off and discuss it among yourselves as to when you think God called each of you. It'd be interesting to hear your answers, but I'm not there, but you can do it among yourselves. When did God call you and choose you? You may turn the tape off now and discuss it. Okay, let's turn the tape back on. And when did God call you and choose you? Is this the way that God just knew that he had a certain number of people that he wanted, so he called a bunch and then threw them up against the wall like mud and see how many sticks? No, 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 not on your life. When you understand that God is building a temple, his temple, a master temple, and he is the master builder of his house, you have to know that he has to have designed and planned for every single piece, every single block that's going to go into that temple before the construction ever started. Any builder, any architect, has the building finished on paper, on a blueprint, certainly in his mind, long before any construction started. I want you to think about that. A master builder who's building the ultimate temple wouldn't just go down to any lumber yard and buy a bunch of wood into any stone quarry and buy a bunch of stones. He's going to order the exact kind of wood from even perhaps specific trees from a specific forest to be cut by special cutters and special tradesmen who really are top notch in their work. Same thing with the stonework. They will be specially carved out, prepared and designed individual stone for specific spots. They're not just going to go down to some quarry down here and buy this or that and see what's there. They planned exactly what they need and they're going to build it to spec, build it to exact specifications. Now if a master builder will do that, do we expect God, who's been designing his spiritual temple, his spiritual family, to do anything less? Do you really, brethren? So why were you called, you, and when were you called? The honest answer is you won't fully know the exact reasons why you're called until you're shown the exact spot in God's spiritual temple that you're being prepared for. And then everything you're going through, all the experiences you are suffering, every ordeal, every joy, every hurt, every experience will come to light as to how they were made to fit into God's purpose and how they fit into God's purpose for his glory and purpose. I want that to sink in. As we go through this topic today and next time, I want you to go away with some definite possibilities beyond even what I'm saying here. But you will understand exactly where you fit in when you see all this happen. So when did God know and plan you? Many of you will probably disagree with me, but here's what I've come to believe. God would not leave his building parts to chance. He designed each piece from the beginning. His temple is not coming together by evolution, but by design and purpose. I believe it goes way, way back when God knew exactly what he wanted in each section of his building. God is planning his, his building, his holy temple, says Christ uh, his uh, son over his own house, whose house we are. Hebrews 3, verse 6. Hebrews 3, verse 6. His own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast to confidence in the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are his temple. And I gave you lots of verses in the transcript. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 is one you could write down, and there's a bunch more. 1 Timothy 3, 15. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Timothy 3.15. Now this message is not focusing on being the building of God except for the fact that it is. And it has to be a carefully planned out building down to every last detail. And if you're part of that building, you had to be planned out ahead of time, long, long ago. Okay? Now get this. Just as the building 
that has not yet been started is already perfectly designed and drawn out and thought out and is already finished in the master architect's mind. So is God's temple. So is God's family. God does not have children by accident. Each of you, each of God's children, is a planned child. Each of us is planned. I'm talking even to those of you who were born outside of wedlock. Even those of you who were born as illegitimate. Even you, there's no such thing, by the way, as an illegitimate child. There's only illegitimate parents. I mean, every child is precious in God's eyes. Even you who are among the called, who were born crippled and blind, deformed or without much in the way of talent. Those of you uh, listening here on computer, if you just hang on for a second, my tape just turned over and I have to wait for the tape to pick up. I want to say that again, what I just said. All of us, even those of us who were born illegitimately, we don't have illegitimate children, just illegitimate parents perhaps. All of us are precious in God's eyes. Even those of you who were called, who were born crippled, born blind, born deformed, or without much in the way of talent, you are not here by accident. You are not here by accident, even if your parents thought so. I saw a bumper sticker I do agree with. God makes no junk. You are no piece of junk. But being designed and perfected to be the child of the very highest. I want you to really let that sink in. Turn now to Psalm 139 with me. Psalm 139. I'm going to read this from the NIV. New International Version. I want that to really sink in, okay? So let's see when you were designed. Get ready to be blown away. Psalm 139, verse 15 and 16. Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Is that mere poetry? Is David talking literary, taking literary license here? Exaggerating? Or did God inspire those verses too? Now turn to Ephesians 1. But I just want you to remember what it said there in Psalm 139. You saw my eyes, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before I was born, he says. Now perhaps we should reframe the question from when did God call me to when did God create me, at least in his mind, so I could fulfill his reason for calling me and calling you. Get ready to see what Paul said. Some believe this matter of predestination has to do with how many God wants to call, just a number, that he has predestined a certain number, not specific individuals. But how can that be when you read all these verses I'm going to show you, when you're part of a holy temple whose builder is God and who's planning each specific stone? Think about it. I personally believe and teach that God is much more precise, much more specific than just having a number in mind. Let's read now Ephesians 1. I hope you're there now. Verses 4 to 6. Ephesians 1, verses 4 to 6. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. It's not just saying that Jesus was before the foundation of the world, but he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoptions as sons. Verse 11 and 12 says the same thing. <coughs> I believe that God not only foreknew you, you. I think God planned you. Planned you. Long ago. But had to therefore bring together all your ancestors to get the right DNA, lineage, and pedigree he wanted in you. 
Why didn't he do a better job, you ask? Well, because he wanted to bring glory to what his power could do. He didn't want the mighty and the wise and the brave and the strong and the rich and the royals and the nobles primarily. Now, if he could track which animals were firstborn animals in Egypt when all the firstborn males of, the, of Egypt had to die, including the animals, in that tenth plague, could he not work out your pedigree? Not to make you perfect, but to have you fit perfectly into his plans. So that makes it even more humbling and more awesome to realize you've been on God's mind from before the foundation of the world. I really believe that. Many of you will not agree with me on that. That's fine. We can wait till Christ explains who's right. I think I just want to read scripture for what it's clearly telling me. I'm not afraid to read it. In Jeremiah 1.5, God said to Jeremiah, who may have well been an ultra special selection, or it may be generally true of all of us, I'm not sure, but in Jeremiah 1.5, speaking specifically about Jeremiah, but I think it could also be there for all of us, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah 1.5, read it, please read it, please turn to it. I want your eyes to see it. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And I believe that just as specifically God foreknew Jeremiah, he foreknew you. Just as God chose Abraham, Sarah, David, Ruth for specific positions in his kingdom, he also had to choose specifically you and me for specific spots. Sure, they may be the foundation uh, with Christ, who's the chief cornerstone. Sure, they may be the pillars of the temple. But, you know, you also have to plan the doorknobs and the tiling and the roof parts and so forth. Listen carefully to the next, next uh, uh, passage we'll read now in Romans 8. Turn with me to Romans 8. Romans 8, verses 29 and 30 to 30 for whom he foreknew he also predestined whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren moreover moreover whom he predestined these he also called and whom he called these he also justified whom he justified these he also glorified Sounds very specific to me, doesn't it? Sounds to me like God is being very precise. Very much like God is. Very precise. Very exact. He's not going to leave his temple up to chance. Those he predestined. These. These he also called. That doesn't sound like just predestining, predestining a certain number of people. Sounds like he's much more specific than that. Again, when you're building a temple, you have to plan all the parts, the important ones and the less important ones. Just because you and I haven't been kings or priests or prophets doesn't mean we were less important in his building plan. He had to plan the carpet. He had the tiling, the marble, the, the toilets. He had to plan everything. I don't care what part I, I am in that temple. I don't care if I'm a doorknob. I don't care if I'm a toilet in the temple. I don't care as long as I'm in that temple, brethren. Paul made it clear in 1 Corinthians 12 that all parts of the body are important. Your hand's important, but so is your armpit. Some of us are armpits. Hallelujah, I'll be an armpit. If that's what God's called me to be, be the best. <laughs> Pardon my foolishness, but be, I'm making a point. You get the point? You love your eyes, you better love your elbows as much. You love your tongue, you better love your backside as much. Where would you be without a working backside? I don't mean to be gross. I mean to make the point. We're all needed in the body of Christ. Now remember, it's God the Father who specifically gets involved in your calling. It's God the Highest who chose you, predestined you by His foreknowledge of you from before you were even born. He works through Jesus Christ. But he's very involved in your calling, selection, and growth. Your angels report to God the Father specifically about you. 
Jesus came to reveal Father as our dear Abba, an approachable God, an intimate God, that because he died for us and his side was ripped open, we can now go personally to the highest being of the whole universe and pray as Jesus taught us. Daddy, dear Abba in heaven, Father in heaven, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of Jesus Christ, I come to you. God the Supreme Being is the Father of Jesus, and in the same way now is your Father and my Father. It says so in John 20, verse 17. Now turn to 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. 1 Peter 1, verse 2 now. Elect, that means chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Not just Jesus, God the Father. In sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been called for obedience also, brethren. 1 Peter 1, verse 2, but that's by the foreknowledge of God the Father. One more, or two more maybe. Turn now to 2 Thessalonians 2. I really want to hammer this home that God foreknew you before the earth began. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14, and this will explain so much to you about your your ancestry and your descendants. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit, etc., etc. God from the beginning chose you. I hope you're not feeling ever ever again, lost in a crowd, unimportant to God or anybody else. You are part of God's temple. You are part of the body of Christ. You are part of the wife of God the Son. You are part of the kingdom of God. You have been raised to sit with Jesus Christ on his throne. Brethren, let's wake up to the massively awesome high calling we have. Turn now to Romans 9. I know, I know the principle of freedom to choose called free moral agency. But the word free moral agency is nowhere to be found in the Bible. But the concept of freedom to choose certainly is in the Bible. And yet you can't get away from these verses I'm reading to you here. Somehow God works with free moral agency or the concept of the freedom to choose and with the verses I've just given you. He puts them together. That's how great he is. Now in Romans 9, verses 10 to 21. Romans 9, verses 10 to 21. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived. I, you've got to turn to your Bible in this. Don't just listen. I want you to read it in your own eyes, with your own eyes. Please, 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 please grab your Bible and read this. Romans 9, verses 10 to 21. I'll wait for you. Come on. We're running out of time. Romans 9, verse 10. And not only this, Romans 9, 10. But when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac... For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, choosing, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it's written, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Now, brethren, let's stop there for a second and grasp what Paul is saying under inspiration by God. Before they were even born, God's choice was clearly made on his decision, had nothing to do with what either child had done because they hadn't done anything yet. They hadn't even been born yet. Let that sink in. Verse 11, the children not yet being born had done no good or evil. It's incredible, isn't it? God chooses things and people that fit into his plan, not according to what we're planning to do. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Romans 9, verse 14. 
What shall we say then? Is there any unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that just amazing? <coughs> Excuse me. And then it talks about Pharaoh and how his heart was hardened and that we shouldn't, goes on from there to say we shouldn't be questioning the pot doesn't uh, question the potter. Why did you make me thus and so forth? And think about Judas Iscariot. You know, we're told that Jesus said that uh, he knew from the beginning, John 6.64, Jesus knew from the beginning, John 6.64, who would betray him. And later it says in Mark 14 that it would have been better for that man had he never been born. What's that telling us? It talks about Pharaoh in Egypt, how there were times that he wanted to let Israel go. He said he would let Israel go. And then it says, though, that God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There were times he hardened his own heart, and there were times that God hardened his heart. If you read the end of Exodus 9 sometime, you'll see that it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, but then right after that it says God says he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Poor old Pharaoh really didn't have as much choice as you might think. Now, if Paul couldn't clearly explain the concept of how that's fair or not, or how that worked, and he says, hey, we're not going to question that, it does appear to me that God is much, 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 much more involved in our birth, our purpose, our calling, our selection, our ending, and our creation more than we've ever realized in the past before. God the Father is totally, totally involved in his children and his family planning is complete. There are no accidents. God does not have children by accident. He plans every child he has. He plans every child he has. God does not have accidents. I want you to get that. Now let's build on these verses and let them sink home personally. Be prepared to praise God as you realize now the extent of your individual calling. God the Father is building his house. The church is his house, 1 Timothy 3.15. Jesus is the high priest over that house. The verses are all in my transcript, Hebrews 10.21. The Father selects the living stones of that temple, which we are, 1 Peter 2.9. You know these verses. I'm not going to turn to them. And when you're building a temple, you don't just order so many blocks. Like I said, you order specifically which blocks, just like the temple of Solomon, and brethren, I'm telling you, Temple of Solomon was just a foretaste of what the uh, the picture of God's temple was supposed to be. Now, 1 Kings 6, verse 7. 1 Kings 6 and verse 7. I want you to turn there, though. This is about Solomon's temple. You know, when they build the blocks for the temple, when they built them, they knew exactly what they wanted. And those, those uh, stones were cut at the quarry and were tested and chiseled and refined and and perfected and polished and everything. Now, First Kings 6 and verse 7. And the temple, when it was being built, was built with stone finished at the quarry. We are the quarry. We're in the quarry now, brethren. The quarry is a dirty, painful, dusty, ugly place. We're in the quarry. It's called life. We're being polished in the quarry, being finished in the quarry. And when the angels gather the stones, the living stones, and bring them together into the temple of God, that's when we see exactly where we're going to fit. And we're going to be praising God. Anyway, the stone finished at the quarry, 1 Kings 6, 7, so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. That's worth a whole sermon right there about, about that. But that's not just about some physical temple, but it's a prophecy for the true temple of God. It's about how it's going to be when we all come together as living stones. And when Solomon's temple stones came together, stones had been perfected, chiseled on, polished, sculpted, and tested off-site. So when the stones all came together, you couldn't even hear the sound of a chisel or iron. And we're told by historians that it was so perfect you couldn't put a pen knife between the stones. So God the Father personally planned you, called you, chose you, and prepared for you because he wants you to fit perfectly exactly where he wants you to be. 
And that is something I've come to so strongly believe. It leaves a lot of questions about God, even his fairness. But as Paul said, some things we have to accept in faith. Now another reason God could have called you and called you now may be, well be because he may be actually having greater plans for one of your descendants. Okay, so when did God start? Way, way long ago. But another reason why God called you now and called you is because you fit in, again, that overall plan. Just as a stone three blocks up needs the stones that are two below it, you may well be being planned because of uh, your significance to a descendant that God wants. And that's, I want you to start thinking much, much bigger than you have been, much bigger. Think about how God was preparing for David generations, hundreds of years before he was born. Long before David was born, among David's ancestors was a very unlikely black Canaanite, Rahab the harlot. Call her the innkeeper if you like. The Hebrew, Hebrews 11, I mean Hebrews 11, the Greek in there, talks about her being a harlot. She was a harlot, but she converted to the true God of Israel. And one of her descendants was Boaz. Boaz marries another unlikely Gentile, Ruth, the Moabitess. She was clearly a Moabitess. You read it all and you can see it's all there. All these combined to eventually create Jesse, the father of David. David was the eighth son of Jesse. Eight has significance as meaning a new beginning. And so anyway, you see in Matthew 1, when you get the, where you read the ancestry of Jesus, how they have all these names that we don't know very much about. Ram begat Amitadab, Amitadab begat Nashon, Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon, probably one of the two spies, begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Matthew 1, verse 5 I'm reading. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. God wanted David. And he wanted David with certain personalities, certain types. And you got to say about Rahab, she had a lot of spunk. And God may have wanted that in David's ancestral lines. And he planned that in Rahab. God was putting together the Gentile and the Israelite, you know, back with Boaz and Ruth. God isn't working just with Jew or Gentile. He's working with Africans and Asians. He's working with, he's working with Hispanics and Europeans and Middle Easterners and, and Arabs. He's working with everybody that he's working with. It doesn't matter what your past is. When we look at the lesson of Rahab's harlotry, it's how you end up that counts. And she became one of the very ancestors of Jesus the Christ. Don't forget that in Exodus 20, we are told in the fourth commandment, in the second commandment, I mean, I think that's what I'm thinking of here. Uh, Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything. That's not, okay, that's not the fourth commandment. Uh, but that's, okay, right here in Exodus 20, verses 4 to 6. But my point here is reading in verse 5, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations, but showing mercy to thousands. What I'm saying here, brethren, is that we've got to think generationally. When we do something righteous and good and we are pleasing to God, we may be bringing blessings to a thousand generations beyond us, brethren, a thousand generations beyond us. That's what it says in Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. God has called you, like Rahab, to break the pattern of iniquity in your family life, in your ancestral life, to start a new pattern of obedience. But unlike disobedience, it can have impact for three or four generations. Obedience can be impacting our line of descendants for much, much longer. Read with me Deuteronomy 7, verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandments. A thousand generations. That's why we here in this country, in America, can enjoy the land we have because of promises that were made to Abraham. That's why David, because of his righteousness, God said to Solomon when he was turning evil, you can read it for yourself if you want to. It's in my transcript, 1 Kings 11. 1 Kings 11, verses 6 to 13. You know, Solomon started out fine. 
but he turned evil. I mean, the same man who had asked for wisdom and had asked God to be with him, he marries a thousand wives uh, and then concubines and wives, and then he does evil, and God becomes angry with him, 1 Kings 11, verse 9. And then verse 11, the Lord says to Solomon, because you've done this, I'm going to punish you. He says, I'm going to tear away your kingdom from you. But, he says, I won't do it in your days for the sake of your father, David. And he says in verse 13, and I won't tear away the whole kingdom. I'll give you one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David. Okay, so that was just a few years after David had died, maybe 20-some years after, because of David's obedience and favor with God. Long after he had died, his son Solomon had gone off track. God was telling him he'd be merciful because of his servant David, his father David. Hezekiah, 300 years later, when he was praying for God's help, when Sennacherib was uh, surrounding Jerusalem, with his Assyrian armies, he says the same thing to Hezekiah, that he would hear his words for my servant David's sake. How many times has God been merciful to you and to me, perhaps because of the obedience of our ancestors? How many of your descendants are being cursed or blessed because of what you are doing now? Brethren, we've got to wake up. And start thinking generationally, much, much bigger than we ever have. We are impacting just as Adam and Eve made a certain decision. And we are all out of the garden now, except the few who are being invited back into God's presence. Now, even if you have no children, God is still working in you and with you on ways that you can personally impact others' lives for generations yet to come. The actions we do today, for good or bad, will impact many, many, many lives. That's why you were born, because you fit in a way that you will not understand until you are resurrected. We'll get into this much, much more in the second sermon on it. But remember the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, with Jimmy Stewart? In the movie, they show what would have happened in that little town of his if had he not ever lived. And they show the incredible ripple effect of his life. He had no idea, but in the same way you probably have no idea what kind of ripple effect your life, your words, your action are causing in the lives of so many for good and for bad. I know I've caused some bad in my life. I've repented deeply for that. And I know I've caused some good in my life. I'm, I'm dedicating my life for good now going forward. And I hope you do the same. And why did God call you? When did he start his plans? I want you to get this. Long before you were ever even born, he knew you, planned you, wanted you, and caused you. Long before you were ever born, you may feel like you're insignificant. Don't worry about it. God has a plan for you. Part 2 will go into much more detail on that. Don't let Satan rob you of the wonders of how God wants you, you personally. God then assigns Jesus to work with you so that when the final trumpet is sounded, you can be presented faultless before his holy throne, ready to stand before his majesty, our Father, and sing the new song of the redeemed in private concert for God and for Jesus, for the 24 elders and the cherubs around the throne. May God speed that day. Brethren, God isn't relegating this calling to anyone else. He personally, God the Father personally, is working with you through Jesus Christ right now, but He personally called you, planned you, selected you. I think that's a good place to end this part one. Next time we'll pick up with more specific reasons why God chose you and you specifically. Today's main points were these. He was building the foundation and we're, and we're only building the foundation for the next sermon. God chose the weak to shame the strong and the wise and bring him glory. That's why you were so weak. <laughs> and me too. Uh, because God's going to perfect us in the end. There were indeed some nobles and mighty among whom God called. Among those God called. And I pointed out how God the Father himself does the choosing. He gets very involved in you. And I pointed out how God the Father planned and selected you. And planned you out long before 
you were born and I think from before the earth was created he had this all pla planned out and mopped, uh, mapped out it's just not godlike for him to just do it by happen chance and by you know let's see who sticks it's just not the way God works God is so precise when you look at creation and you were then called when you were for God's purpose and part of that purpose could be revealed in what God does with your descendants and when it all comes together we're going to glorify God and sing those songs to him in happy joyous praises this is Philip Shields your brother saying keep that relationship strong turn your heart to God the Father turn your children's heart to, to, to God the Father and to you and you turn your heart to them and all of us keep the relationship strong until Jesus Christ returns may he come soon God be with you all